Hi. All right, I'm doing my live outside because it's too beautiful not to be outside. And it's wickedly hot in my house. So I'm doing it outside today. This is um, chapter eight of Mindsight by Dr. Dan Siegel. This will also go up on my YouTube. And I heard that my last live is messed up. So I will re-record my thoughts on chapter seven, um, just in case anyone couldn't um, watch the last video. This one is really interesting. So this one is about memory and trauma. And I have to tell you, if I had, you know, a million hours to <laughs> go back and study more things, this might be one of those things I would look into. So um, this patient, um, st actually, he, he focused on, on three different patients in this um, chapter. And he starts off with a patient that is experiencing, I'm looking at all my notes, PTSD um, from Vietnam. And it's really interesting because this chapter deals with some of the things that I have been interested in for a very long time. It's actually when you deal with parenting and attachment theory, a lot of times we talk about implicit and explicit memories and how they kind of shape who we are and how we live this and experience this life. So we're going to talk a bit about that. So this patient um, basically was experiencing flashbacks and having very vivid memories. And Dan Siegel makes the point of saying that memories are for people who experience trauma, right, are really raw mental data that is bleeding into the present. And these are what you would consider flashbacks. Like uh, if you're, you watch the story of us, they, they do this kind of very well with a couple of the different characters. And trauma um, that's experienced is basically memory that we experience at one time and how it influence, influences us at the future time. So if you think about it, we all have experiences and it's really hard, you know, when as a personal growth coach, when I have clients and we talk about trauma because we tend to um, do one of two things. Usually, and at least with a lot of my clientele, we tend to write off trauma as not trauma because it's not as traumatic as somebody else's experience. But really what I want to tell you is that your brain doesn't care <laughs> whether your experience was more traumatic than anybody else's experience. Trauma is trauma. So if you had an experience that is affecting how you experience life now, it was probably traumatic for you. And it's still trauma that has to be dealt with. So he does talk about experience being neural firing and when we experience anything new, I hope that didn't mess you up too much. Um, that neural firing creates new synapses, right? Or it can strengthen, strengthen synapses that we've already built. Okay. And we've talked about that previously, so I'm not going to spend tons of times on that, but oftentimes the neural net fires together and there's either an external or an internal trigger that creates this entire network of firing because the synapses have basically run a computer program is how I explain it. Um, just so you know, we can experience this and not always recognize it as a specific memory. And I thought this is, this is really an interesting part, right? Because he used the example of riding a bike. So riding a bike, you know, is firing off of kind of like memory from muscle memory and neural experiences for balance and things like that. 
but we don't usually recognize it as a memory. We don't recall it as a memory. We just do it. And so that would be an example of implicit memory. So there's perceptions, emotions, bodily sensations, behavior, mental models, and priming that are all part of implicit memories. So priming is kind of like interesting because that is usually in parenting, we talk about that a lot. Like if you are habitual with your kids, sometimes the mere, um, I don't want to say event, but the, the mere using like a, um, putting on bathing suit gets them ready to swim. Like literally their body is like doing the motions and preparing itself to be in a colder water and all of those things. Even if they were cold before, once they put on the bathing suit, now it's like, oh, I'm not cold. I'm ready to go in the water. Now, this is the foundation really of the past influencing the future because your implicit memories are not recalled. So they're not something that you're going to say, oh, I do remember that one time when I was at camp and it's not like that at all. It's an kind of almost an automatic response and you kind of don't know where it came from. And there are three unique um, facts of implicit memory. And I thought these were really important. One is that there's no focal conscious attention for its creation. In other words, it's not like, you know, a memory where I looked at and I'm really focusing on one thing and, oh, that is reminding me of this time. There's none of that with implicit memory. Implicit memory is when it's recalled from storage, the second characteristic of it, we are not aware that it's actually a memory from the past. We, we don't recognize it as such. That, and that was a great example of riding the bike. It's not like we're like, oh, this reminds me of the time when I was two and my dad. We, it's not like that. We just get on and do it. We just do it. It's not a memory. It's just an activation almost of something. And three... It does not require participation of the hippocampus. And this is going to become important in the explanations later. And remember that the hippocampus is a part of the brain that integrates, right, information with direct attention. So implicit memory is literally encoding things without attention, so it's really interesting that he gave a really cool example. If you, and I, cool being, I think it's cool scientifically. It's probably not cool when I think of it socially because it was kind of mean. But there was a patient who was having issues with short-term memory, which is affected by the hippocampus because you can't, she couldn't encode memory long-term. She couldn't transfer it. So she would meet a doctor and she would say, just so you know, I'm probably not going to remember this. Okay. They have a whole conversation. He leaves, close the door, comes back in and it starts all over again. She doesn't recall his name. She doesn't recall the previous conversation that happened. And so this time he leaves and comes back and he put a little pin in his hand so that when she when to shake his hand, it hurt. It was a little pinprick. And they went and had the whole conversation. He leaves. He comes back again. And he goes to introduce himself and reaches out his hand. And she refuses to shake it. Not because she has actual memory of what happened previously. So she's not recalling the specific memory. But she said something like, sometimes... Um, doctors do things that hurt was what, what she said when she didn't want to shake his hand. She was hesitant. So it's literally the pain that experience was encoded without focus of attention or the ability to recall it and put it into permanent memory. It's really interesting, evolutionarily speaking. Um, and also 
he makes a point to say that implicit memory can be a feeling. It can be a belief. It can be our prejudgments. It can be just an emotional response to something like, you know, your own bias to something. You might say, I don't know why. However, I just always whatever. This could be due to implicit memories. So an experience that was so um, influential in your life that, and it could have happened so young that you literally didn't have that ability. So children before the age of five or six have a really hard time with explicit memory. They can't recall memories the same way, which is why they call that child children amnesia because they sometimes can recall something or have a bias or an opinion or an emotion, but they don't actually recall the memory. So he then goes on and talks about explicit memory. So this is the memory that you're probably familiar with where you do have focused attention and you organize it in your mind. This also leads to the ability to have autobiographical memory. So it like paints the picture of yourself to yourself, which is pretty cool. It's a scaffolding of knowledge about the world and also ourselves and others and how we all fit together. And it's your acute awareness of the past. And we've talked about in previous chapters when people have issues with that, right? And how that can kind of be really important to have a filling life currently is to make sure you have that ability to recall explicit memory. Explicit memory can either be factual or episodic. So, you know, that is the two different hemispheres kind of thing. We talked about that with a different patient where there are the like facts that you remember. And then there's also the episodic, the autobiographical narrative that you're telling yourself. And this is specifically linked to the hippocampus, which the hippocampus is like that link between the limbic system and the cortex. It assembles all the puzzle pieces together. And that integration is key, right, to be able to kind of have a good idea of where we stand and how we interact. All right. Then he talks about cortisol, and that's one of my favorite things to talk about. I've talked about that even before I became a coach, and I used to um, talk to a lot of people about diet and all of those things. Um, cortisol is one of those hormones that can really wreak havoc in your body, and cortisol is also linked to any increase in stress. Um, whether that's physical stress or emotional stress, it you can see it when people have anger or rage. It's really a heightened amygdala response. And this disrupts the hippocampus. When that happens, it literally cuts off. And so I call that amygdala hijack. So if you, sorry, I'm outside, so I'm flicking off bugs. Um, if you have a explosive kiddo, um, it is very easy to see when the amygdala hijacks and it cuts off the hippocampus because it literally, the ability to recall is not there. So there might be times when you see someone who is an amygdala hijack and then they calm down and then you're having a conversation and you said you're trying to kind of go over things that happened and they may say to you, I didn't say that, or I don't remember saying that. They literally have no recall. There's no, and that's how it, it, it becomes uh, much easier to change your kind of treatment of others who are in that state and knowing that they don't have access to that cortex that allows them to kind of navigate these things in a logical, reasonable way. So this also that, you know, amygdala hijack is exactly what happens during traumatic things. And flashbacks, Dr. Siegel says, maybe pure implicit memories without integration. 
So in other words, for whatever reason, and in the example of PTSD from war, what happens is when you're experiencing something that traumatic, your cortisol is so high that literally it, your amygdala takes over and cuts off that cortex because it's so traumatic. It's trying to protect itself. And when it does that, it is not coding those as explicit memories. Now, because the experience is so vivid and so life altering, it does fire different synapses off and you could be putting those directly into implicit memory. Um, this also, by the way, happens with alcohol, sleeping pills, anything like that, that's going to mess with cortisol. Um, your adrenaline increases and when that happens, basically your awareness gets shifted to imagination and it's, it's this chapter is so interesting if you like any of the neuroscience stuff because you've heard or maybe you haven't heard, but if you um, at all interested in side effects of things uh, like Ambien and sleeping medications or blackouts um, where people are functional but they don't really have control over what they're doing, basically... It is this kind of same pathway that is cutting off the cortex and increasing adrenaline so much that you're shifted to like part imagination. And so you're in this like weird, different kind of world. I think it's so fascinating. I would love to um, really read or study this more. I think it's fascinating. Um, the flashback trigger, right? basically blocked integration, right? And when that happens, that trigger in the current, not in the past when it happened, but in present day can cause hyperarousal, which can cause explosive reactions. It can also cause numbing or the feeling that something is unreal, right? It can cause nightmares. It can cause flashbacks all of those things we see in PTSD. And actually, all of those things we see sometimes as side effects um, where uh, with alcohol addiction or pill addiction or when you mix narcotics, it's really interesting that you can see and think about that as that's exactly what's happening in the brain. All right, so this part is also really interesting. Part of... The frustration that uh, you, was written about originally with PTSD is the lack of ability to consolidate, like to get the memories to be integrated. In other words, I remember reading, I wish I remember where I read this, but that, that's my guinea hen, sorry that part of the frustration was it was almost like you were dealing with um, an Alzheimer's flashback, except these people didn't have the same diagnoses, like the same thing wasn't happen happening, but you couldn't get these people out of it. This is, this is an interesting little tidbit. So consolidation is when we put um, the memories from implicit into explicit. And it, this kind of happens, this ability happens in REM sleep. So guess what happens if you have PTSD? You don't sleep well. In fact, the part of sleep that doesn't go well is REM sleep. So literally, they lose the ability to consolidate that information, even if they go through therapy and are learning things, right, and are digging into it, if they can't have REM sleep, they lose that ability to consolidate and convert that implicit memory into explicit memory. So, holy cow, so much good stuff. Basically, he calls this harnessing the hippocampus to heal trauma. I love that so much. Harnessing the hippocampus to heal trauma. Now, 
he also makes a really big point in this one that um, it's also true that our memory, and this is everybody's memory, is probably not accurate because of the processes of consolidation and the mind's ability to do things like integrate implicit memories into explicit memories where you had really big emotions um, or really traumatic experiences. When we recall the memory, it can be tainted and it can be tainted both ways. Um, a lot of times it can be tainted to protect the person. So he has um, an example of somebody who was abused and she was recalling memories and she was saying, oh, and then this stranger came and through therapy then realized, oh my gosh, it really wasn't a stranger. It was someone she knew. Her mind had switched that memory. But it's also the reason why um, it it's really hard to accuse people based on memories. Um, I say this often because we tend to skew them towards ourselves to protect ourselves. And if something was scary, it might not have gone down as you say. And even as you tell the story more, it might change a little bit, which is where we get into really crazy stuff with wit eyewitnesses, which is another passion of mine. <laughs> the Innocence Project is one of my favorite things. So I think this is really interesting because your memory is actually changed and can be influenced. So it's really super interesting. Also, this, um, this whole process with um, disruption of the hippocampus is, has been linked to dissociative orders, disorders. So it all kind of makes sense when you think about it in that, that ability to remain present. Um, but he does talk about how that's a strength because really our resilience to deal with things as they come up is such a strength and to protect ourselves um, and even to trust others, right? And it's, you know, in, it's, well, I guess I want to say it's instinctual. It's evolutionary. That's, that's what our brains do. And sometimes that avoidance and that numbing and that even the experience of flashbacks are a way that our brain is protecting ourselves. Um, I think it's really important. He ends this chapter by talking um, about using therapy to go through this, of course, because, right, and using Mindsight. He um, really highlights the safe place, and we talked about that, I think it was in the last chapter, so I'll go back and re-record. Um, and that it's really interesting to dive into some things because the fears sometimes that we have. And, and I say often to clients, like, let's try to not act out of fear. We be, we want to be aware of fears and we want to deal and process with them, but we don't want to react out of fear. And here's a perfect example. So he had a client who was in college and she was successful, but she was starting to doubt. And she had this huge fear that like, oh my God, I can't take this test and do all these things. I'm just going to fall flat on my face. And she's, he said, oh, it's so interesting that she chose those words, fall flat on my face. That's like a, a really stark image, right? So they were doing um, some recall and saying like, when did this start? Have you always felt this way? Like kind of going back. To, and I, you know, I say like childhood is one of those things that believe it or not plays such a role in all these things. <laughs> and it turns out that this person, when she was three years old, was riding her tricycle. It was a brand new tricycle, brand new bike, right? She was so excited. And she went off and she went down the hill and something happened and literally fell and knocked out her teeth, fell flat on her face, really traumatic. She doesn't recall that at all. She doesn't. She, re, you know, if she remembers her mom saying something, oh, I remember when you fell on your tricycle, but she didn't really recall the memory. However, 
her brain had this implicit memory really equating novelty to fear, to danger. And so whenever she recalled several things from her past and any time it was something really new or different, she said, I always get this feeling, right, that I'm going to fall a flat on my face. It's going to be a disaster. So crazy and cool. All right. So if you were going to deal with this, and by the way, we all deal with little parts of this. Implicit memories kind of getting in the way. A lot of times I feel like we don't even pay close attention to them um, until later on in life, just because life goes by so fast, I feel like. Dr. Dan Siegel says, you have to integrate into autobiographical memory acceptance, self-compassion, and that leads to healing. So if we can recall things with self-compassion and we can heal from those things, then we can move forward and realize that when these emotions come up, that it could be the fear my guinea hen really wants to be on camera. Um, and also to remember that the fear is irrational. It's not a rational, thought out thing. And oftentimes, I think people are mistaken when we say you don't give in to fear. I don't want you also not to ignore fear because there's no healing in that. Um, the healing really comes with recognizing and dealing with what happened in a safe place. So that safe place might be with a coach. It might be with a therapist. Wherever that safe place is for you, please do it. This was a super cool, super cool chapter. I think this chapter could be its own book. So I will definitely look at his resources for this um, chapter in particular. He's really good about citing resources because uh, I think it's a really cool chapter. It leads to all sorts of cool things. Um, leads back to attachment theory right? Um, how your relationships with your caregivers were before you can, sorry, I'm going to do that again in case you, the relationships with your caregivers before you can recall or have actual memories of that could have had implicit memories. So it's really interesting. All right. That's chapter, I believe eight of Mindsight. And I will be being back next week with the following chapter and um I hope it's a long weekend so uh I'm hoping I can re-record the previous one if you have questions comments want more information or start a discussion you could do it here you could do it on my Facebook page or you could do it on my YouTube channel best self best health